Um, I think really there are two sort of very common approaches to looking at what fascism is today. Uh, firstly, you can see the temptation to label anything that is reactionary as being fascist. Uh, any reactionary policies that come out, the police are fascist bully boys or so on, or even where you see the mistakes made around organisations like UKIP that are right-wing racist populist parties but not fascist parties and so on. So that's one part of the side of how people look at, at fascism today. The second thing which I think happens as well is that in the media and in academia, you have a sort of tendency, if you like, to label fascists anything other than fascists, to find new terms for them all the time, whether that be, you know, neo-Nazi, post-fascist, populist right, far right, and so on. And so what I want to sort of try and do today, really, is to fall into neither of those camps, but to try and give an analysis, if you like, I suppose, of the growth of, of fascism. Um, and I think ever since fascism entered the stage of history, Marxists really have attempted to, to understand it, to define it, and also to develop strategies to, to beat it. And of course, an analysis of something, getting an analysis is absolutely central to then how you go on to develop your strategies for how you tackle it, uh, what sort of movements and coalitions you build, um, and so on as well. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that both fascism and communism really dominated the first half of the 20th century as ideologies and movements and so on um, that people have to get a grasp on and, and try and understand. And there are all sorts of different approaches to this really. You can have sometimes quite a static approach to this where people will give a list of factors that have to be present in order to define something as, as fascist. Um, also, just to look, for example, at the policies of fascists, uh, fascists in, in government, like in Italy and in, and in Germany. Actually, I think both of those things are very difficult to, uh, to give us a proper definition of fascism. One, because I think you know, a formulation of a list of a, just a collection of things that therefore equals fascism is far too static. It doesn't really give the dynamic of how fascist organisations grow and then come to, come, come to take power. I think also on top of that, how fascist organisations and movements start to grow, what they do in that period and then what they do when they are in power are also two very different things. And so we can't just take on face value, this is one of the policies or this is a policy and therefore this defines what a fascist, uh, a fascist regime is. So really what I'm going to try and do is to try and give a sort of a multi-layered approach really if you like. To, to looking and understanding at the, at the growth of fascism. And I think, you know, it's so important today that we have this because, you know, everybody will have seen the European elections recently and will have felt a massive sense of alarm as what's hap at what's happening across Europe. Clearly, the pinnacle of that being what happened with the Front National in France, for example, an incredibly dangerous situation where we actually have the Front National very rooted now in the political system uh, within, within France. But clearly as well, we also have Jobbik in Hungary and so on. And then, of course, we have a collection of far right-wing populist parties like UKIP, like PVV, Gilt Wilders Party and so on, who are also really a part of reaction um, across Europe. And so our analysis, I think, is, is, is very important. Um, I want to really start um, by um, first of all taking a sip of it. I'm slightly dry from chanting on my demonstration today. Um, but really by sort of looking at the Marxist interpretation of classical fascism. And like I say, I'm not going to be focusing on fascist regimes once they are in power. I'm going to be focusing on the rise of those fascist regimes and how Marxists at the time attempted to grasp and analyse what these, what these new movement and new ideologies and so on that were emerging um, at the time. And so I suppose if you think about the period of 1919-1939, I suppose it would be a period of what you would call classical fascism. <coughs> Now, there were early attempts by Italian Marxists. Bordigo is one of them, who was the head of the uh, Italian Communist Party, for example, to try and analyse uh, fascism. But really what they sort of put forward was, was that it was quite a simplistic view of what fascism was, in that it was just really a violent wing of capitalism. Because really, what you see following on from the First World War 
is a massive level of political, ideological and economic crisis uh, taking shape inside of society and also a level of reaction across Europe to worker struggles, to people attempting to fight back, to people coming back from the First World, World War demanding more and demanding decent reforms and so on. And therefore we see reaction across Europe to these workers' demands and reaction in the face of crisis as well. And therefore there was really a sort of strand of theory, if you like, that capitalism was entering into its final stage, into its terminal decline. And that what fascism represented really was, if you like, the political wing of capitalism at the point at which it was in, in decline. And so there was no sort of attempt really or understanding of fascism as being something separate to capitalism. What I think you see coming then from another set of Marxists, I think is a far more complex and sophisticated analysis. Um, Marxists such as um, Antonio Gramsci, for example, who's an Italian Marxist, who's an attempting to make analysis of the rise of Benito Mussolini um, in, 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 inside of Italy and so on. We also have Clara Zetkin, Sass, a Hungarian Marxist, Trotsky, Talheimer, Togliatti. These are all people that are really worth looking at in terms of looking at how people started to formulate their early understandings of, of, of fascism. So I want to look, first of all, really, at the Italian experience because for all of these Marxists, the nub of their argument was that fascism really represented the offensive capital in a situation of profound economic, political and ideological crisis. And the element of crisis is massively important for this because it's not just the case that people can turn up at any point in time with a set of ideas, fascist ideas, stick their flag in the ground and pull people around them just on the basis of what their ideas are. They are absolutely organically linked to levels of political and economic crisis in society that throw up massive questions about the ability of the ruling class to rule, um, the ability to make significant changes in society, to have ordinary people's voices heard and so on. It's in the context of crisis that we start to see fascist ideas actually growing and starting, and, and starting to build. Also, therefore, fascism was to be located, as I said earlier, in the context of European reaction. But it wasn't just synonymous with every form of reaction. You know, fascist violence wasn't just counter-revolutionary. It wasn't where we, where we saw revolutionary movements only emerging that we see the rise of fascism in terms of counteracting them. Actually, fascism really was against all forms of working class activity, strikes, pickets, occupations and so on. Any form of working class activity that took place, actually we see really fascism in opposition, in opposition to this. The further thing which I think they identify, which I think is also a key factor in this, is that fascist violence wasn't perpetrated from, just from above. And that's important because the analysis that said basically that fascism was just the wing of capitalism in terminal decline, what you, what you didn't see was, you know, states, governments, ruling classes initiating this violence on the streets, these levels of terrorism against working class activity. Actually, what fascists did was to build, really, um, a movement, I mean, of course, we'll look at a second in, in where they start to build that movement. But what we see is a combination of demagogy in terms of the ideological pushing of ideas, but also then terrorism, very much terrorist methods that are used against workers uh, wherever, they, wherever they were organising. And in terms of really thinking about what was the social basis of fascism? Because if we're going to depart from the idea this is just an offensive of the ruling class, where was the social basis of fascism? And really what they really argued was, was that this was to be found really, um, amongst, it's a class that Marx calls the petty bourgeoisie, the middle classes, if you like. So you see in the Italian experience, what we have is a whole number of demobilised soldiers who've come back from the First World War, really linking up with a variety of social groups, white collar workers in some instances, small shopkeepers, small manufacturers in the towns and the cities, small land holders, and then of course more prosperous peasants and sharecroppers um, in the countryside. Now there are two factors really which 
made these social groupings much more susceptible to fascism. One was the economic crisis which really threatened the petty bourgeoisie with proletarianisation. In other words, when the economic crisis took place, this was the sort of middle strata, if you like, that felt squeezed from both sides. They were neither represented by the bourgeoisie, the ruling class and so on, who actually, of course, as we know and we can see now, in times of crisis, are seeking not to pay for that crisis, but to make workers pay for that crisis. And so we see really this middle strata who don't feel represented either by the socialism of the working classes, and in Italy we see this in a massive way, you know, the levels of, of militancy amongst the working class, where we see the huge factory occupations in Turin and so on, but also where we see not just the Italian Communist Party, but social democratic parties in Italy who really are talking about, in the wake of the Russian Revolution, being able to bring in this revolution into Italy, this is going to reconstruct society on a much more equal basis and so on. There was no delivery of that inside of Italy. And therefore we see this sort of middle strata, this petty bourgeois class, who feel their interests are being squeezed from both sides, and therefore who become much more susceptible to um, ideas and, and organisation organization of fascism and so on. And really how Gramsci puts it um, was this, he says, fascism had for the first time in history discovered the secret of mass organisation of the petty bourgeoisie, an ideology of national unity and an organisation modelled on an army in the field. And it was Gramsci who noted that you know, localised activity where you see the smashing up of workers, trade unions and community halls actually could unite the interests of the small and the large proprietors at the same time. They could both see an absolute benefit out of really attempting to render working class activity, trade union activity, uh, uh, render it useless and attempt to, to smash it up. And so Gramsci wrote, fascism is a movement which the bourgeoisie thought should be a simple instrument of reaction in its hands, but once called up and unleashed is worse than the devil, no longer allowing itself to be controlled, but proceeding according to its own internal logic and ending by taking no account of the interest of the existing order. Now clearly, Gramsci is writing this in an attempt to understand the rise of, of fascism. And I think one of the things that he overstates really is the independence of fascism from capitalism. It's important to note that fascist movements do ha absolutely have their own internal drive, but actually once in power, fascism rules on behalf of capitalism. It has never challenged capitalism in that sense. Its words and so on in the run-up to its attempt to take power always appear actually far more radical than it is in terms of actually what it does once it's in power. Once it's in power, it rules on behalf of the ruling class and on maintaining, on maintaining the status quo. So I want to then look really at the rise of the Nazis in Germany because really there are similarities and differences with the experience of the rise of fascism in Italy. And I want to just sort of look at really, first of all, and I think this is something which is probably quite notorious, is the theory of fascism that was developed within the Comintern in its so-called third, third period, which was in 1928. Uh, after, sorry, after from 1928 onwards. And it's notorious really for its contribution to the impotence of German communists in the face of the rise of, uh, of Hitler and the rise of the Nazis inside of, inside of Germany. Really, this third period Stalinism surrendered, if you like, the level of understanding that had been developed of fascism, the level of understanding that had located the petty bourgeoisie as the social basis for, 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 for fascism. The demagogy and the terrorism at the same the time, the twin methods that had come about as well, is really abandoned uh, by Stalin um, and, the, and the Comintern in their, in their third period. It is important to note, of course, that fascism didn't occur a second time in precisely the same way that it did in, in the first. I mean, the varying differences, I think, which are important to point out between Italy and Germany are really the following. Germany was really a very in advanced industrial country. Um, it had really one of the best organised and most powerful working class movements in, in Europe. 
And, you know, I mean, people want to sort of look at some of the figures with the membership of the, the SP Day, which is equivalent, I suppose, of our Labour Party, if you like, the KP Day. You know, these are mass-rooted working class organisations inside the German working class. And really, the other thing which I think is different is that Hitler's road to power was prepared by a series of very right-wing populist regimes, unstable regimes, and they're not particularly easy to define. But these, the political instability of these regimes was a part of the picture that paved Hitler's way to power. And so really what happened was, was that we see the smashing of the working class after Hitler has come to power inside of Germany, whereas for Mussolini, the rise of the Italian fascists, it was the attacking of the working class on the way to power as well. So these are some of the sort of differences that are, uh, that are important to, to note. And so really, when we sort of look at, for example, um, the, uh, when we look at the theory of, of the, the, the third period of the common term, the theory around, around, around fascism that was developed by them, really you can see it under the leadership of Talman in the KP day, the German, the German Communist Party. And really, you know, when we talk, I mentioned earlier about the notion that fascism really was the political wing of capitalism in its terminal decline, in its final stage, in its absolute crisis. And really, Talman really builds on this, this, this notion, and also builds on the notion, therefore, that fascism just equals reaction. All capitalist regimes, whether parliamentary or dictatorial, were defined as fascist. You know, at best, in lots of ways, they represented different degrees of fascisation, if you like, is how they looked at it, because this was the final stage, and therefore, this was that any political representation was fascism in the in the ascendancy and in its attempt to to uh, and its expression of of crisis. And really, there was effectively no um, there was no flexibility in the in 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 the common turn by this point. We see, you know, inside of of Russia. Um, you know, it's become a bureaucratic elite that is running, that is running Russia now, following on from really the counter-revolution against the Bolshevik Revolution. We see the absolute bastardisation of Marxist theory by Stalinism, absolute straitjacket really in terms of analysing and, under, and, understanding, and understanding fascism, absolutely abandoned the notion of it being the, the mass movement of the petty bourgeoisie, and really the, the other thing which I think happened, which deepened this sense of this, was that there was a very temporary period of capitalist stability following on from the First World War, but actually we see the return of a much deeper and bigger economic crisis in 1929, which almost then goes to you know, bolster their theory and their idea that this is capitalism in terms of climate and it's going to, and it's going to collapse as well. And so, in the face of the crisis, governments across Europe are becoming much more reactionary, much more reactionary on working class people, and again, we see this, this reassertion of this theory. What it sort of led to was the um, disastrous concept, concept of social fascism, uh, which really became common from 1929 onwards. Um, and, sorry. Um, and so the notion of social, of social fascism was that social democracy really was the moderate wing of fascism because it provided the bourgeoisie, if you like, with the means of securing consent to reactionary policies which didn't require the use of violence. Also, the concept of social fascism, I think, played a key part in the disastrous tactical errors committed by the KP Day from 1928 to 1933. Now, you know, when you think about it, it was about not uniting with the SP Day, seeing the SP Day as part of the problem. You know, it wasn't just the case that this was a diktat from above in terms of just the Stalinist bureaucracy pushing this ideology forward. There was also very concrete experiences of the Communist Party workers inside of Germany who, you know, in 1919 had seen the Freikorps unleashed who murdered, you know, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. You know, when you think about the fact that you had the massacre of communists in Berlin on May Day in 1929, where 30 communists were killed, 200 of them were severely injured, there was also the absolute experience that people had on the ground of how the KPD had attacked, how the SPD had attacked the KPD. And so a combination of these factors really led to an absolutely disastrous policy, which was to see really a total disunity, a total division between the KP Day and the SP Day um, as well. 
So, in the face of this, really, what do we see? Because actually, you know, it was, in the end, I suppose, the events themselves that exposed the bankruptcy of the KP Day and the Comintern policy. By the time Hitler had been in power for 12 months, it was evident, even to the most Stalinist hacks, that the KPD had suffered a massive, massive defeat. Then at this point, what we start to see from um, Stalin is the development, really, of um, the popular front policy. Again, something people might, might have heard of. Because really what Stalin was now doing was recognising the danger that an expansionist Germany really presented to the Soviet Union and really argued, therefore, for the need for a defensive alliance with bourgeois powers. And really, the, this interest dictated the communists should now join a united front with social democrats in defence of working class freedoms, and not just they should now join with the people they've been told beforehand to totally uh, ignore and, and not be a part of. Not only should they now join social democratic workers, they should also join up with bourgeois parties and governments as being the bulwark, effectively, against, um, against, against fascism. Now, the Popular Front policy was debated at the 7th Comintern Congress in 1935, which was the first one, incidentally, to be had since 1928, the political direction was defined by speeches made by Dimitrov and Togliatti. Togliatti's address was developed, devoted, really, to the international implications of Nazism. He defined fascism as the open, terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinist and most imperialistic elements of finance capital. Now, this provided really a necessary analytical basis for the Popular Front policy, because by identifying fascism with such a narrow strata of finance capital, it enabled potential class collaboration to take place across, you know, broad collaborations to take place with bourgeois, with bourgeois parties. The Popular Front policy really meant, in practice, the subordination of individual communist parties in different countries to the immediate interests of Soviet Union foreign policy. And evidence of this direction was apparent in the readiness of the French communists, for example, to surrender any independent policy and abandon extra-parliamentary struggle upon joining the Popular Front. And as Trotsky says, the PCF was turned from a revolutionary tiger into a trained donkey with a carload of patriotism. And so what we then also see is that we have people like Trotsky and Talheimer who are opposing Stalin's third period policies and the period of the United Front. And of course, it's a really unfortunate irony um, that those thinkers, those Marxists who had the clearest analysis of fascism and its rise and how to stop it were the ones who no longer held a position of interest in the international communist movement as well. And what Trotsky and Talheimer do is attempt really to reassert what the class base is and what the organisational methods of fascism that, um, that were developed initially by the communists in, 19, in the early 1920s. They really argued for a principled united front with trade unions and with social democracy against, against, against fascism as well. Some, I think, important contributions were made as well to the advancement of the definition of fascism during that time. And it would be really important for people to read Trotsky's writings on the rise of fascism in Germany as well. Now, it's fair to say that over the last sort of 30 odd years, the Marxist analysis has come under attack by a number of different academics who say that, fa that Marxists really underestimate um, fascist ideology. I think really it displays a crude understanding really of both Trotsky's writings and the Frankfurt School for example who have all looked at the um, physiological impulses behind fascist ideas. But really I think it's absolutely vital that we insist on the primacy of the economic causes of fascism as well, that we don't just see it as just being a set of ideas. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It comes alongside absolutely economic and political crisis at the same time. And therefore, you know, we're talking about putting ideas and situating them accurately among all the factors that influence this complex phenomenon. Then there's an author called Paxton, who we've got the book here actually, Paxton's sort of, again, Theories on Fascism, which I think, again, are another really sort of, really good book for people to read. Because according to Paxton, it's not the themes taken up by fascism that define the phenomena. Since fascism is based on a rejection of universal values, it's more disparate than other political movements, and it can't be understood as the expression of the same fixed essence. 
but it has to be understood within specific historical contexts. And what Paxton proposes to examine the development of fascism through five stages is firstly the creation of a movement. Again, important to look at in terms of the emergence of movements, when the emergence of street movements from fascists, you know, we saw this from the British National Party, we start to see them first of all marching on the streets, then we see development of a, a electoral strategy where they attempt to separate themselves out from the violence, make themselves much more respectable and so on. But importantly, the first step of this is to look to actually the establishment and the creation of that movement on the ground. The second stage for fascism is to look at its rooting in the political system. And this is where I think you have now, in a couple of countries across Europe, fascism has reached stage two. It's absolutely political rooted with inside, with inside France and Hungary, for example, and that represents the second stage. The third stage of fascism, Paxton looks at the seizure of power. And again, we start to see differences compromises made with various different ruling class leaders. I mean, it caused huge arguments inside of fascist movements at the time. You know, you look at the light, Night of the Long Knives, where actually Hitler goes and kills a whole number of key people uh, inside, inside the Nazi party. Why? Because they got, they're of a purist ideology. They are opposed to this notion of making compromise to get into power. But Hitler and Mussolini were absolutely clear about making compromises to, to, in terms of getting, in, of getting into power. Fourth stage of fascism then is to look at the exercise of that power and again something which we haven't got time to go into today but an analysis of course that looks at how power is used by fascists when, when, when they have it. Fifthly then of course is to look at the long term fate of fascism, whether you have radicalisation of it, entropy and so on. And so really I suppose what I want to do finally to sort of conclude is to sort of reassert really a basic definition of fascism. Firstly, I think we have to say that fascism is a product of massive social and political displacement as the result of the First World War. Secondly, it differed from other forms of pro-capitalist governments in that it has at its core a mass movement, mainly drawing support from the petty bourgeoisie and from ex-members of the, of the armed forces. It's not to say they don't attract any sort of working class support. Of course, as they grow and become bigger, they, can, they absolutely do do that. But initially, and in the growth of those movements, incredibly important to locate the class basis of that. Thirdly, that fascism adopts a twin-track strategy of gaining power by both the use of violence and parliamentary elections. Fourthly, it was used, though not always controlled, by large agricultural landowners and industrialists who turned to fascism because they were unable to subdue the working class by the existing political and social order. Fifthly, whilst its aim is to destroy working class and democratic organisations, once in power, fascism doesn't represent the interests of the petty bourgeoisie that it's come from. It rules on behalf of capital, absolutely. And really, I suppose, a central feature of all fascist organisations is the concept of the enemy within and the external enemy. So you look, for example, at the rise of Mussolini inside of Italy, the concept of the internal external enemy. Internally, it was the communists who were the enemy. Externally, what are we looking at? The, bourgeois, the Bolshevik revolution in Russia in 1917, and therefore a concept of the enemy within and the enemy without, attempting to push down Italy is a massively important part of their, of their ideology. And of course, since 1933, racism and xenophobia have played a really central mobilising role in, in fascist, in fascist, organi fascist organisation. And so fascism does have a political ideology. An understanding of it can help to provide answers to such questions as to why and what kind of people are attracted to fascism. And just as importantly, it gives the historian really insights into what the ability of fascism as a mass mobilising as mass mobilising force. I think some of those sort of concrete things are things that can give us the basis and the ability to have an analysis of the rise of the, some of the fascist organisations across Europe today and also an analysis and understanding of what is not a fascist organisation like UKIP and the PVV and so on as well. 
I also think we have to say that different tactics and strategies have to be developed in dealing with fascist parties like the BNP and Jobbik. And you can see that from Unite Against Fascism in terms of some of the different strategies and tactics that we've had to employ in terms of fighting the BNP when they've been in positions where they've had council positions. You know, it's very different, of course, when people start to gain positions in power with local government, European um, Parliament and so on. Very different long-term campaigns in combating those, very different to when it is when you're combating the EDL. You can combat the EDL on the streets and so on. Actually, you have to have slightly different tactics around that, around, around it when they, get, when they gain electoral power. Also then, of course, we use strategies like no platform for fascist organisations like the British National Party. Clearly, when it comes to dealing with people like UKIP, we can't use no platform policies when it comes to people like UKIP. We have to use a different set of tactics and strategies around fighting back against those. And I suppose, finally, the analysis of fascism and the analysis of the rise of fascism in its classical periods, I think, really, the most important part of that is that it enables us not to repeat the same mistakes that were made by the KP Day and the SP Day at the time as well. It enables us to be able to fight today for real unity amongst Labour Party members, amongst revolutionary socialists, amongst trade unionists, amongst anti-racists and so on, to develop an absolutely united front policy that can actually really see, you can see the successes of that in terms of what UAF has done here. But actually the importance of this analysis in places like France now, I don't think can be, can be underestimated. Therefore, for me, the Marxist analysis of the rise of fascism, I think is one of the most, is, is, is the, the best tool in the hands of people in terms of fighting back against the Front National, the British National Party, and so on today. Good afternoon, comrades. My name is Tony Hodges. I'm a member of the UCU. Um, I've got two questions for Joe. The uh, the first one's very simple, and so I'll. I'll I'll get that out of the way, it's short and simple, is how important was socialism in the development of a mass move, a, a national socialism in Germany in, in, uh, Germany in terms of building a mass movement in, in, in the 20s. Um, the, the, the second thing I want to ask about, uh, I'd like her comments about the, the in a sense, the, the misuse of the word fascism. Um, I'm involved in Stop TTIP, which is um, a campaigning organisation uh, in opposition to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment uh, Partnership, which is the, the EU-US Free Trade Agreement being uh, um, negotiated for us um, in, in Brussels. Um, and um, many of us involved in, in, uh, in Stop TTIP d describe the world that the corporations want to, uh, uh, want, 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 want to create uh, through, through these various free trade agreements, because TTIP isn't the only one, there's several of them coming down the line, is uh, 21st century corporate fascism. And um, I'm, I'm aware, even while I'm, although I quite like the term, it slips off the tongue very nicely and it's a nice little rhetorical device, um, I am also aware that it's, it's not very uh, politically precise. Um, uh, for, for, uh, but but, but there, are, there are one or two reasons why I quite like it. Um, the... the um, um, what, what TTIP wants to do, the, the, the free trade agreement, is wants to reduce the, uh, what they call the non-tariff barriers to trade. And when they talk about trade, really they're talking about the maximisation of profit. And, and uh, many of these things they describe as non-tariff non barriers, they also describe them as trade irritants. These things that irritate the corporate world are things like health and safety legislation, um, the right to paid holidays, the right to holidays at all in fact, uh, maternity benefits, the right to um, uh, join a trade union to protect your, your remuneration and your conditions of work, and, and, and a, 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 a most extraordinarily long list of things that actually make our lives livable. Um, they want to actually do away with all of these things because they get in the way of the maximisation of profit. And um, I can kind of see in, 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 in uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 years' time yeah, uh, a situation in which globally we have an, in, an enslaved working class. And I'm wondering whether in fact the corporate world, whether capital has any need for mass movements in the street now, when you have um, the entire political establishment has, has bought into the neo neoliberal project, 
Um, there's there, perhaps there's there's no need to have Arianism or the, the, the right-wing Catholic nationalism that, that the Italians and the Spanish and the Germans used as an ideological glue to hold their mass movements together because we've got consumerism and I think that probably you know does the does the same trick so I'd um, yeah basically just like some comments on that. Right, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, UKIP because I think that um, Paxton's five stages kind of uh, analysis is really, really useful. And I wanted to ask the question of can UKIP be seen as a sort of pre uh, first stage? Because um, Trotsky in What is Fascism and How to Fight It talks about um, the historical role of the petty bourgeoisie um, and how they're um, traditionally used by the ruling class. Um, and so he says that, as, as a tool of the ruling class, and so he says that fascism, um, it, it, as something different, is the independent political movement of the petty bourgeoisie, um, although in the final analysis uh, that movement will ally itself, of course, with the ruling class. Um, but it certainly begins as an independent political movement, separating itself from the ruling class. Um, and now we know that UKIP appeals to the petty bourgeoisie um, and that it's taken a large section of middle class support away from the Tory party, um, predominantly due to the, the ruling class response to the economic crisis and how that response has been very antagonistic to um, petty bourgeois interests in this country. So I think, personally, I think this could be seen as a sort of uh, representative of a sort of, as a sort of pre-first stage um, to fascism and I'd be interested to know um, what the speaker thinks and what everyone else thinks. Yes, yes, comrades. Uh, yeah, when David Beacon got elected in 1992, uh, I just started my first year at university, so we set up a whole uh, series of meetings based on Trotsky's uh, fascism, what it is, and how to fight it. Um, now, myself, and it, it transpired that the comrade that I was uh, doing, the, doing the posters with also had the same problem as me, and uh, we didn't really quite know how to spell fascism. So uh, we've got the S's and the C's mixed up. So we put the, the, the posters all around the college saying fascism, what it is and how to fight it, and someone put at the bottom and how to spell it. <laughs> so, 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 so my first point, comrades, is make sure you know how to spell what it is you're fighting against. Um, but on a, more, on a more serious note, uh, when I was uh, in 1978, when I was 14, I tried to join the Young National Fund when I was at school in Southall. And, um, how I got pulled from that position to being a member of the SWP, <clears throat> I won't bore you with, with, with the details, but suffice to say that, um, that the arguments that we've had with UAF about how we confront Nazism and, and what happened at Tower Hamlets against the EDL the last time, last time they, they marched there are very important because the, the, the key thing for us, my mates, when I was at school, and how we got pulled from that position was not only to do with what happened with Blair Peach <clears throat> and I would urge you all to buy the pamphlet that the party's just uh, produced that, uh, that talks about all the different people from across the spectrum that got influenced by Blair Peach's uh, murder. But uh, the, the, the important thing for us was it was, was a constant work that was done by a &L activists and the little yellow badges and the big stickers and every time we put a National Front sticker up on a wall somewhere or we did a bit of graffiti on the wall, someone would come along and they would put a sticker over it, someone would come along and they would change that NF into something else, into an anti-Nazi league thing. And that, to us, was the most demoralising thing uh, that undermined all of our confidence, really, to, to be able to do anything at school. And undermined the racism as well. And then when, Bl when Blair Peach was murdered, it, it really was a game changer, because we thought this is someone that was willing to put their life on the line to fight against something which, you know, we weren't at all willing to do. We were just stupid 14-year-old kids, really, you know. And we were angry, but we didn't quite know what we were angry at, and we, we had we'd misdirected it against black and Asian people. So, so the point I really want to make is that, that, that the, what we do in UAF isn't just about the mass confrontations, although that's really important. It's about every time we see a sticker, every time we hear a comment, every time we see a bit of graffiti, we rub it off. Because what that does is it stops the people, like I was when I was 14, becoming fascist properly and joining organisations because it saps the confidence from out of them. So everything we do in UAF is very important. Oh, hello. My name's Carol. And I, I love talks about fascism because it gives me the opportunity to lower the tone and tell my very favourite story. And if anyone's heard it before, please excuse me. My dad had to leave Germany in the 30s and the only job he could get was working in the sewers. He said working in the sewers was good because the people were nice and also you could have a bath once a day after your shift. However, once a week, they all used to forego their bars and walk into the East End, get into a little talk with the black shirts, 
unshowered straight from the sewers and shake themselves a little bit just to, because they felt a bit itchy. And Dad said to me, do you know something? Our clothes were dirty, but the money was clean. And he said, unlike the black shirts, their uniforms were clean, but their opinions were exactly the same as the material you found in the sewers. So that's what fascism means to me. That's all I thought I'd share it with you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad we've got a meeting uh, titled What is Fascism? Because as, as Joe said, there's, and other people said, there's all sorts of mistaken views on, on fascism from the from serious people, for instance, at the weekend, somebody uh, got in touch with the United you know, Against Fascism office and said, why are you out on the streets in Glasgow protesting against a fascist orange order? Now, we had a patient chat with this person. They're not a fascist organisation. I remember a, a demonstration in Newcastle, one of many, against the EDL, and surprisingly, perhaps, the law, the law, there was a small lawless march, orange order march there in Newcastle, and they came up and said, we're nothing to do with the EDL, we're not... We're, they chucked them out. And of course, there's been collusions over time um, between fascist elements and loyalists and, and so on and so on. But to, to talk about going along and no platform in loyalist marches, loyalist marches seems to be a mistake. And that comes from mistaken theory. There's good people who say this, people we, want to, we do work with um, and so on and so on. But to, to argue that lo loyalism is akin to fascism classic fascism and, and modern day fascism is a, is a bad mistake in my opinion and, and one that has to be patiently talked through with, with people who, who come out with that. And I think today as well across Europe there's, there's all sorts of forms of ultra-leftism. I mean, again, Joe talked about the common term out there. In tragedy of the common terms position, the third period, all the rest of it. Now we know from the, the facts that, that the SPD and the KPD between them had more votes than Hitler. The, the, the KPD's organisation is incredible. You know something like 32 cycling clubs, all this Tour de France stuff. 32 cycling clubs. Christ, if we had two cycling, one cycling club, the SWP, we'd be chuffed. They had 32. You know these were these were really incredible organisations in many ways. Um, well, I think across Europe there's a danger at the moment of, of ultra-leftism and substitutionism, i.e. that small groups of people think that they can take out fascist organisations. They tried it in Greece, brave people, good-hearted people, people again we work with, they tried it in Greece, it didn't quite fit and it didn't really work. What worked in Greece, and the Greek comrades will obviously tell you better than I can, was, was the mass movements, the general strikes, the involvement of tens of thousands of workers in activity, in united action, no matter what else the arguments might be about Tsaritsa and so on and so on and so on. And you've got a whiff of it here as well in a, in a, in a, in a form as well. Um, I.e., for instance, there's people, people now on the left in Britain saying, small groups of fascists, we need to, why are you calling national mobilisations to UN? Why are you calling national mobilisations? Because there's 40 people, 50 people perhaps going to turn up in North West London a week on Saturday. We need a national mobilisation against them. I don't think that's right. We have to get it right tactically in terms of scale and timing. These people are on the down. Of course we don't ignore them. There's a mobilisation involving us, RMT, all sorts of people, right? But we have to take it in scale. Preston, I remember Preston, I'll never forget Preston a few years ago, uh, demonstration, us, uh, UEF called it, we had lots of people, passive support, the police done the numbers, they increasingly have done it for years now, the um, prevent strategy and so on and so on. No thought there's. Hardly any Muslims turned up because they were, they were told if they do turn up, they'd be liable to arrest and so on. 150 people, if that, stood the line. We, we, we stood there, 150 of us, 2,000 EDL. Now, did we then go from that? Christ, there's a real problem. What we need to do is, to be frank, mask up, get small squads of people. No, we didn't. You have to go back to the drawing board. Again, it's patience, hard arguments in some ways. In other ways, people like yourself, like revolutionaries, just as, just as infuming as we were about Preston, what the police did, what the state did. Right, contrary to people like Hope Not Hate, who seem to think you can make deals with the state, and we brought it back. So that is in Walthamstow, uh, where the speaker's from, as in Tower Hamlets. What did the EDL in this country, and this is not you know, something like, oh, aren't we wonderful, but it's a practical example. What did a, a, a street movement that three years ago had three and a half, four thousand people on the streets? What did them was patient, long term, united front work. All kinds of people, no matter what the differences were, there are many differences tactically. EDL had to be stopped, that was the number one thing. So what happened after Tower Hamlets last year? Two months later, Robinson and Carroll, the EDL leaders, resigned. I think that's, that's, that's um, something to fight for. Um, and I think 
you know, like to, to just reiterate, really, if you get if you get your analysis wrong, it can lead to all kinds of ultra left traps you fall into. And never mind you'll get in trouble; it's people around you get in trouble, and there's no need for it. And that's why I think meetings like this are, are crucial for for spelling out concrete activity from from good theory. Joe, I really enjoyed your talk, but I do have a question. To recognize the accent. I do have a question based on my political experience in the U.S., and that is. How does Marxist interpretation of fascism help with what I consider a very serious pro political problem and economic problem in the States, and that is the rise of the Tea Party? Now, I must confess that in public forums in the Midwest with the Green Party and Missouri parties, that I have accused the Tea Party of being a fascist movement. I've said that, uh, well, they are a radical, populist movement intent on bringing down the government. And indeed, this particular Congress has done absolutely nothing for two years. And in about half the states in which Tea Parties control both houses of the legislature and the governorship, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a living disaster. Arm carry into restaurants um, and other kinds of crazy laws. We don't have the violence yet. But I wonder if we have an emerging situation that could go in that direction. And the main thing is that uh, they are corporately funded. I got to tell you, I work with the Green Party. We have to pass the hat in order to get a local demonstration against Monsanto, um, whereas the Tea Party can somehow bring 100,000 people to Washington, D.C., paying all sorts of transportation and lodging and food and everything else. That's done through the billionaires, the Koch brothers, and other very rich people. That is the capitalist, uh, capitalist element. But what I don't see is in the United States, in fact, I see the opposite, is the terminal decline of capitalism. Um, indeed, income inequality, as, as, as we know from Piketty's book and, and from much other work, uh, has, has become obscene, uh, multiplied 10, 20, 30 times over the recent decades, and uh, essentially is controlling the political process, it's controlling the economic process. And I think there's a serious situation. I don't know what to call it, and uh, I don't know, but I'm willing to be informed about how Marx would approach this or how other socialists would approach this situation. Thank you. After our next speaker, I ask that we limit our contributions to two minutes so that we can fit everybody in. So after our next speaker, we have the man at the back with the light shirt. Um, yeah, I just want to address the issue about um, sort of slippery definitions of fascism because I think, you know, when the last speaker said, um, you know, how do we characterise the Tea Party? Um, and you talked about things like corporate funding. Well, there's corporate funding for lots of different sorts of things. I remember 10 years ago, I was in India for the World Social Forum, which was absolutely tremendous and fantastic. It was one of the largest social forums that had ever taken place. That was funded in part by the Ford Corporation, okay, um, the Ford Foundation. Sorry. Um, now, you know, does that mean to say that um, the World Social Forum was a fascist initiative? Does it mean to say that the people who took the money from them to put on the to put on the event uh, were somehow sympathetic to fascism? I don't think that quite gets to grips with actually getting to terms with what fascism is. And I think that um, you know, when again the uh, first speaker was talking about. Um, sort of the corporate takeover and you talked about neoliberalism and I think that for me it's very important to have precision because when you think about things like you know cutbacks to maternity leave as you talked about or cutbacks to holiday entitlement or to sickness pay etc and you think about what neoliberalism is I mean, these sorts of cutbacks that our bosses try to do to us wherever we are, I was on a picket line this morning um, where people were describing that um, you know they've had their tea breaks taken away and now they're threatening to take away their parking permits. These are people who work with housing, um, you know, um, in the housing benefits department. Now the thing about all of these sorts of cutbacks are is that this is part and parcel of what happens on a daily basis in class struggle. Your boss tries to, to you know to take back a bit extra from you. 
you know, if you've got a union organisation, that's there to try and prevent that from taking that little bit of extra away from the rights of workers. This is something that happens in every single daily basis of what's going on in terms of the class struggle. And therefore, for me, the question of precision about what fascism is, is absolutely critical. And, you know, and I want to reiterate some of the points that Joe and others have made here, because I think that, you know, the point about the context in which fascism arises is absolutely crucial. You know, the idea that when Joe talked about the, the 1930s and the 1920s, the whole question of what Paul was referring to earlier, the deep, enormous, profound economic crisis and political crisis that we saw in the 1930s is what could produce the outcomes that we saw in terms of fascist organizations beginning to mobilize. What's happening in terms of the Tea Party inside of the United States of America today does not come anywhere near to that level of profound, deep economic crisis and how that throws people into an absolute state where the middle classes can become crazy and start to turn to all sorts of horrible organizations in terms of solutions. And therefore, you know, not only is the context absolutely critical, but also the class basis of fascism is absolutely important in terms of the petty bourgeoisie. And you know, when you talk about um, sort of what they do to the workers' movement, the final point I want to make is about fascism, is that it is in favor of the total decimation of opposition. And that is particularly the opposition of the organized working class. That's, the, that, yeah, that's their critical thing that they're trying to push. Because it's only when they're able to achieve that, as they were able to do in the 1930s in Europe, that they are then able to offer themselves as a safe pair of hands to the bourgeoisie in terms of cementing their rule and therefore taking away all of our rights and destroying the freedoms that we all enjoy. And that's, you know, we have to have that precision in terms of understanding specifically and historically what it is in order to name it for what it is and also to have the correct strategy of fighting back against it. Hello, sorry it took so long to get in from the back of the room. Um, I'm not going to be very uh, long in talking about this. Two things occur to me that speakers have raised. Um, one, I'd be interested on Joe's observations on Spain and uh, Portugal, because we were stuck with Salazar and Franco to 74 and 75, and people tend to focus totally on Adolf and his friends and uh, Benito. You know, there were others. But I'd be interested on the comments on that. Um, secondly, far more important, I think, for us sitting here in the privileged um, sort of Western developed society, shall we say, is, is the reality of looking at places like India, Central Africa, and where the World Cup would be, of course, in South America, where there's a combination of drug gangs, violence, uh, poverty, extreme poverty, and people being dragged one way and the other for survival. So I'd be interested in Joe's observations. Thank you very much. There's two issues I wanted to come in on. Uh, near the end of Jane's uh, talk there, she, she, she brought up the issue of uh, elections. Uh, I want to come in and say that uh, I think as a tactically we, uh, like a socialist, uh, have, like, particularly here in Britain, uh, had to take a, a, like, we don't want to give, a, we, don't, we don't want to give the BNP a platform, but UKIP are a different cattle and fish now. They have uh, quite a large mandate now. There's a rising, uh, there's a rise of racist attacks, and uh, there's uh, because uh, UKIP are not quite uh, coming out with the kind of language that uh, the BMP and the EDL come out with. Uh, so uh, tactically, we can. I, I think uh, we can no longer just say uh, we won't harm the things. Uh, we'll protest where the BNP come. I think we have to uh, adjust our tactics now because now uh, the second point I want to come on to finally is the state. The state is going to take on more of uh, the policies of UKIP, and the state is going to be the defeating ground for fascism. Uh, and, wh and what does that what does that mean? Uh, it means they're, they're going to uh, basically uh, uh, feed into the uh, like the, the because UKIP are basically the uh, basically the the talk of the town, the talk of the country. Their their policies uh, like their policies are going to get greater scrutiny, but uh, they could end up being in coalition government with the Tories or uh, and. Basically, I think we have to 
uh, also deal with the complexity of the st of the state because the state is also going to be uh, moving to the right, and it, there's going to be a debate probably about or a referendum on Britain moving out of uh, the European Union, and I'll end on that. You see, the unique, the unique danger of fascism, different to any other form of authoritarianism or reaction, is that the aim of fascism is to smash every element of working class organisation, and indeed every element of democracy, to completely atomise workers, which is why it's a unique threat. I don't think UKIP has that as its strategy. I think it's a racist populist party, and we have to recognise what's different and uniquely dangerous about fascism. But Joe is absolutely correct. You cannot understand fascism independently of time and historical place. It will not always emerge wearing lederhosen, right? And with street armies immediately and so on. It's very, very important. Uh, in post-war Western Europe, the fascists had a problem. They lived in the shadow of Auschwitz, but also they lived in societies that were relatively stable liberal democracies that weren't about to crack. Therefore, they had to rethink. And crucial is what's happened in the Front National of Marine Le Pen and her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen. They had to rethink strategically fascism. And what they ended up arguing is it's going to be a long march through the institutions of liberal democracy. We have to adopt an electoral strategy that taps into the respectable racisms that the mainstream politicians foster against immigrants, against Muslims, and so on, but use that to uh, make ourselves respectable, to enter the mainstream institutions, and then ultimately under that, to build up the foot soldiers. But in the first instance, put on the suits, rather than build up the thugs on the streets. This is what Marine Le Pen, like her father, has been doing. And it's alarming, they came first in the European elections, they can command six million votes, but their aim isn't simply votes. Their aim is to reshape that electorate in the image of the core of that organisation, which is fascist, which is why Jean-Marie Le Pen occasionally makes what the pundits call gaffes, most famously when he said the Holocaust is a detail of history. Ah, he's exposed himself. It was a deliberate statement. It was a deliberate statement because he's trying to move his electorate, who vote for him on the basis of racism, it's a step closer to fascism. The, they haven't succeeded completely in this. The Front National is very electorally dangerous, but it, doesn't, it has a weak streak presence. Therefore, it's dangerous, but it is still beatable. We have to understand the nature of that kind of Euro-fascist project that is right across the channel, and people like the BNP and so on are trying to replicate here. We've put our foot on their neck here. That's a very powerful example to people in France, too. Um, I just wanted to talk about briefly, obviously now, what happened in Tottenham recently where we had an attack on a community festival by what uh, turned out to be a Polish uh, fascist group. Now, what, what Joe talks about having a very precise analysis and being able to look at the different faces of fascism at different stages it becomes very important because how do you fit that into the normal narrative? You know, obviously, uh, Polish people here are, uh, you know, new to the country, are immigrants, uh, and so on. But obviously, you know, we, we can say that the, the, the situation there arises from the situation uh, in Poland. Now, obviously, that group is not going to be able to build a mass movement in, in, in you know, North London. But what it can do, of course, is they can uh, cause uh, inter inter-community uh, uh, stress, inter-community violence, and can let the real, you know, the actual BMP or fascists uh, or, uh, uh, grow on that. And I think this is well, this why it's important that our analysis is precise, and I haven't got time to go into it, but that we don't uh, slide in to saying every authoritarian, every right-wing, every nasty thing are, are fascists. We have to be very, very precise on our meaning. I wanted to come back on this uh, argument, well, uh, uh, is it the case that they need fascism now with the, uh, how, uh, how bad neoliberalism, capitalism has uh, as, as, as got? And I think the answer is very much uh, um, yes, if they think they do need it. I think if you look at Greece, it gives a very good example because in, in Greece I think there's something like 19 openly fascist MPs with uh, with golden golden dawn and they were given um, a massive air of respectability by the existing bourgeois parties even though they were quite open about being fascist and violence in the streets against uh, um, 
uh, anti-racists against uh, um, uh, black people uh, uh, and that. And, and um, uh, the mass uh, movement in Greece um, has, has had a massive um, effect, both, both in the sense that uh, um, it, it frightens the ruling class because they've been prepared to fight fight back the uh, the workers workers movement and also the frightens the bosses in in um, uh, 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 and um, gives hope to to our side so they, they they look to fascism they then move away from from fascism when uh, when they see them as counterproductive because there's a danger to it to to it for them they, when uh, uh, they kill a black activist musician um, uh, and there's a mass movement uh, rising against that, the strikes against that. They, they back off and they arrest fascists, uh, put them in, put them in, uh, in prison. Uh, it, 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 it makes a difference what, uh, what our side does. Uh, um, I think it's been a fantastic uh, discussion. My name is uh, Joshua Brown. I'm a member of the SWP in Glasgow. And we had the um, honour of being the first stop on a national um, roadshow for Britain First, an organisation which probably most people in the room will have heard of, if not seen on Facebook, because that seems to be one of their primary modes of operation. They formed from a split from the BNP. They have the former... Um, media director for the BNP and they've spent tens of thousands of pounds uh, promoting their social uh, media profile. So they use populist propaganda um, against animal abuse, against domestic abuse, in favour of um, soldiers and all this sort of thing in order to get people to boost their profile. But what they want to do is to try and recruit a layer of activists and thugs around them for a fascist party. They came to Glasgow for the first stop on their tour. It was the first time that Britain First had actually announced where they were going to be in advance. Mind you, only um, 48 hours in advance. But we had the opportunity through Unite Against Fascism to organize a demonstration which brought together over 200 trade unionists, um, local uh, Muslim uh, students associations, um, anti-fascists from all different backgrounds, as well as people who are involved in the <coughs> independence campaign in Glasgow and across Scotland um, for a mass demonstration and Britain First was not able to attend their first meeting um, point that they had set up. And I, think, I think that's the way um, forward is to build mass broad uh, movements against fascism, expose them for what they are and to strengthen our side while suffocating them of the oxygen they desire. Okay, um, thanks comrades for the um, questions and for the, for the contributions as well. Um, one of the first questions around how important was socialism in the rise of national socialism? And what I think is important to say here is that in both Italy and in Germany, what we see, and most definitely I think it's really, there's a, there's a fantastic little pamphlet called The Resistible Rise of Benito Mussolini by an author called Tom Bean, which I really, it's a nice little pamphlet, I really recommend to people read it, because it really shows how you see levels, really big, good levels of working class militancy in Italy where we see socialist organisation really on the rise, really dominant inside of, inside of Italian society, but also apt, unable to deliver on the promises that they had set out, unable to reconstruct society in the way in which they had, had pushed forward and, and, and when the way in which they had argued for. And therefore, it, the, in that failure, we see fascism's appeal to the petty bourgeoisie and therefore the relationship between the two really is that it was really fascism was a consequence of socialist failure if you like not a cause of the failure of socialism in those countries and that's really the relationship between 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 those two things 
The other thing which I was going to question I wanted to come back to was around the question that you raised around the misuse of the word fascist. And I can't remember your little phrase now around, um, around the sort of stuff around the free trade agreements and so on. Um, but really, what are these free trade agreements about? They are about the ability of the largest imperial powers in the world to be able to go into any other nation state and to take over public services, privatise them and make massive money out of them. That's not fascism, comrades, that's capitalism. Yeah. Right? It's, a part, it's always been a part of capitalism since imperialism that imperial states have gone in and extracted wealth, you know, when it was a policy of colonialisation, you know, when you think now, you know, when, when you think back to, I mean, this is stuff we've been protesting around in the anti-capitalist movement, when you think about the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994 that saw the rise of Zapatistas and so on, this is a part of neoliberal capitalism and to label it as fascist is absolutely confusing because it's not a fascist force that's going into. It wasn't fascism that privatised the water in Bolivia. It was capitalism that privatised water inside of Bolivia. And it's important that because we, you know, this is, it's not an aberration of capitalism either. It's an absolute fundamental part of it and it always has been and it, and it will continue to be so as well. In terms of the question around whether or not um, Fa um, does capital still have a need for, for fascist organisation or is it, is it outdated? Again, it, it's a question of the extent and the scale of the crisis, right? At this moment in time, could I say to you for absolute certainty that the French ruling class will adopt and allow Marine Le Pen to rule in France in a fascist regime? I don't know. I don't know whether it will come to that point. I don't know whether or not the economic and political crisis will deepen to the extent that the French ruling class see the Front National as their only alternative now to, in, to, to rule. And that's an important part of what we're dealing with here because it's not the case that for any ruling class that to bring fascists into power is not a risky strategy. You know, it, you know, to, to, to suspend democracy, to have an authoritarian fascist regime in power, it's a last resort for the ruling class. It's not the first choice. It doesn't come in when they think, oh, maybe we can wing it, maybe... No, at the absolute last resort, when they are absolutely unable, through normal democratic means, to deal with the level of crisis in society, that is when fascist organisation becomes important. The only way, however, that the Front National can position itself to be that important to the French ruling class is by building the movement now. That's why you have to fight to stop fascists at every single opportunity. I mean, of course we know at the moment that across Europe, the three things that the rise of the far right, both the racist populist parties and the fascist parties have in common is the economic crisis, the rise in levels of racism and the political crisis of the mainstream parties. We know that is a feature of all of their growth. It's taking different forms in different countries and the right is fluid in that sense as well. You know, I mean, it's important to come back to Fran's question about UKIP and about it having a petty bourgeois base. You know, absolutely. You can see that at the moment in terms of how UKIP is forming, where they are trying to draw their support from and so on. They are not currently a fascist organisation. Does that mean in five or ten years' time that we might not see a mutation and a reshaping of the forces that are around UKIP? Of course we could. We have to bear in mind that the right wing will organise in a different state of flux and change at different points and therefore our analysis of them and updating it all the time is incredibly important for the tactics that we use and how, and how we take them on now. We know now that UKIP is not a fascist organisation and therefore we must take them on in a very different way to the way in which we've dealt with the, with, with the British National Party for example. Um, in terms of looking at strategies for fighting fascism, sorry, just to come back to also the question about Spain and Portugal, uh, other dictatorships, there are, there are stories aplenty of failed fascisms, which are also important to look at. There are fascist movements and organisations who have attacked the state and have been smacked back down by the state in a most brutal way, in, in many a different, many a different example. Um, and so, you know, some of these, some of these movements fail, and, and of course we've had two of them that have really fundamentally succeeded, but there are a massive list of failures of fascist organisation um, as well. 
So, um, and again, sorry, to come back to the question about the Tea Party. So, the Tea Party, to my mind, is not a fascist organisation. You know, it's a, an incredibly right-wing organisation, again, in, in pushing forward incredibly racist and divisive ideas throughout American society, but not a, a fascist organisation. Um, so, and then to come back in terms of what people are talking about, about the strategies for, for fighting fascism as well, because, you know, it's really important what um, this guy was talking about in terms of squadism, you know, we just have small groups of people that go out and fight the fascists on the streets, they're going to put their terrorist methods out, we're going to combat them in exactly the same way. The only thing I can say to you is this, is that, you know, when we had the EDL come to Walthamstow, there were 200 of them. Now, we could have organised for 200 people to come out and fight the EDL. Actually, we didn't do that. We pulled 4,000 people onto the streets, which was a massive show of strength, and it was about working-class people in Walthamstow reclaiming their space, fighting it back against racism, and basically saying that fascists are not welcome. What did it mean? It meant that the newspaper in Waltham Forest had a picture the, the week after, United We Stand. Now, actually, 200 squaddies who've gone out, and, but you probably could have beaten them up. They're a bunch of freaking fat old idiots, do you know what I mean? They've got no mobility. It's not like they were talking about some strong fighters here. Actually, probably a group of young people could have taken them on and beaten them. Would it have meant that the following week in the article in the newspaper it was United We Stand? No. Would it have pulled the local council in behind us, who'd initially opposed us and told us we were wrong, to say, actually, brilliant, we stopped the EDL. Yeah, you're right, we stopped the EDL and you come, Johnny come lately to come and back us. That wouldn't have happened with squadism. Right? So our strategy of how we fight back against the fascists in terms of the United Front method is an absolute recognition that even in their infancy, even when they are small numbers on the streets and we are not talking about the SS in the way we had in Germany, actually the United Front method of working class people coming together is about a recognition of what fascism represents and it is absolutely anti-democracy, anti-working class and for the interests of the rule, uh, for, for the ruling class as well. And so for the comrade who got up and spoke about why he didn't join, he, why he left the National Front in the 1970s, the absolute policy that we have always had is that if it's a fascist, name it as a fascist. Drive a wedge between the hardcore of the fascists and soft racist ideas and racist and so on in society that can be pulled towards that. You have to name them and you have to have the numbers and the force to back that up on the streets to show there is an alternative to what these people are, are, are offering. Further to that, what else does it mean? Not only do we combat the forces of reaction in terms of fascism, but the united front and the movement that we pull together are people who are also going to raise questions as to why we are in a system that, is, that keeps on going into periodic crisis and every time it goes into that crisis we see the rise of the, rise of the far right. And therefore, we are talking about building movements in which we can also talk about the ideas of ending capitalism and ending the system that produces the crisis on which these bastards grow.